words, that's okay. Thank you everyone for joining us. It's 12 o'clock. Um, we're gonna give folks one more minute to join, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, your microphone should be muted. If not, if you'd like to manually mute it yourself, that would be fantastic. And as we go through our presentation, if you have questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat box and we will answer those questions at the end of the presentation. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna get us started since we only have a half an hour today. Um, as folks are coming in, please feel free to mute yourself. And if you have questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat box and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Welcome to Beyond the Pantry, how food banks and the Kinship Navigator can work together to help our community. I'm Ray Glazer, I'm the director of the Kin New York State Kinship Navigator Program. I'm gonna kick off our presentation by talking a little bit about what kinship care is and what kinship care looks like in New York State. And then we'll transition over to Dan Egan from Feeding New York and Ryan Johnson, who is our associate director of the New York State Kinship Navigator. So first of all, what is kinship care? Kinship care is Anybody that is raising a child in the absence of the biological parent, so non-parents, usually grandparents, blood relatives, and non-relatives known as victim kin, who are providing full-time care and control for children in their homes. Um, right now, there's about 195,000 kids in New York State that are currently be care being cared for by relatives. And I slid right ahead in the PowerPoint there. Sorry, Ryan, you can go backwards. And I think it's important to note, first of all, why kids come into kinship care. Kids come into kinship care mainly for the same reason that they would come into foster care, abuse, neglect, so involvement with child welfare services, um, parental substance abuse, mental health, incapacitation, um, parental death, incarceration or abandonment, um, sometimes military deployment, basically any instances where parents cannot care for the children that they have. Uh, relative will come in, step up, care for the children, um, and children that are in kinship care usually end up in more stable permanent households because they are being raised with people that they know. Um, whenever we kick off kinship care, I always say, you know, think about when you were a kid, if your parents could not raise you, would you rather be in stranger foster care? Or would you rather be under the care of somebody that you know and is comforting to you? Um, most kinship caregivers are grandparents, maternal grandparents, but also we have aunts, uncles, adult siblings, and as I said, family friends, which are known as fictive kin, godparents, neighbors. Um, that step in to care for kids when the parents can't care for them. There's about 195,000 kids at any point in time that are in care of relatives. It's important to note here that the majority of them are not in foster care, so we call those informal placements. Um, you can see the numbers right here. Uh, there's about 15,000 children in foster care out of those 195,000 children. 50% of the families have had contact with CPS, um, but still most of the families opt or are directed to informal placements where kinship caregivers may have no type of legal designation, maybe legal custodians, parental designation forms, guardianship outside of the formal foster care system. So really what we're setting the stage for are families that are stepping in to care for kids that are not biologically their own, without a lot of support. So what we are trying to do at the Navigator and also working in together with Feeding New York State is we wanna make sure that we are offering a referral resource for these families and offering them boots on the ground assistance for where they need it. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Dan Egan right now to talk a little bit about his program, Feeding New York State. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Ray. Um, so, I think everybody knows it's been a tough year. I thought I'd just give you some numbers about how tough it's been and what we can all do about it. Um, so, you know, you've all seen the news. Um, it's, it's just been tough. So Feeding America, which is our national food bank organization, um, has, they calculate how many people are, are hungry in each part of the country. And 
they've said it's about a 46 percent increase in hunger in New York. So pre-pandemic, there were about two million, a little over two million New Yorkers who were hungry um, within a space of a few months, right? Less than one year ago, that jumped up to three million, and we're estimating that's going to continue possibly for several years. None of us knows exactly what the future will bring, but that's our best guess right now. Um, Charitable Food Network, that's you know us, the food banks, the soup kitchens, food pantries, shelters, um, have increased distributions over 50% statewide. That's a statewide average. And in New York City, it's over 100%, which is just incredible. At the same time that we have all this hunger, um, we also have an incredible level of food waste um, nationally about 40% of all the food that we create, you know, between the farm and somebody's table, it gets discarded. It's never consumed. Um, most of that waste happens at the farm or at distributors, not in households, but um, it happens all over. So it's a really unconscionable situation where, um, you know, you have hungry people at the same time we're throwing food in the trash. Next slide, please. So what are we doing about it? Um, so at Feeding New York State, what we do is a lot of government relations, you know, lobbying, <laughs> um, and we worked very hard to try to bring Nourish New York aid um, to the network. So New York State stepped up, to their credit, um, $35 million uh, Governor Cuomo allocated to Nourish New York. Every dollar of that was spent in New York State, at New York State farms, or with um, New York State food producers. Over 4,100 farms got some income um, from Nourish New York, which was terrific for them. I mean, that for some of them was the difference between surviving uh, the pandemic or not because they lost their markets. Um, important for everybody to know, Nourish New York ended uh, at the end of the calendar year, December 31st. Right now, as we sit here, uh, there is no Nourish New York. So what we're doing is working hard to renew it. Um, we've been writing to the governor, calling people. What we're asking is that they annualize the program and just make it a permanent thing. Because we were looking for something like this even before the pandemic started. It's just an obvious, uh, efficient, ethical thing for all of us to be doing to connect uh, the Charitable Food Network to farmers, reduce food waste, and get that good, healthy food to people who need it. The other thing we're doing um, this year is we're sourcing a lot more food than we ever have. Um, our goal is to get more than 20 million pounds of donated food from New York State farms. That's in addition to the food that we buy or that comes from out of state. Um, so we've been doing a lot of that. <clears throat> Next slide. So what can you do? Um, if you're on this call today, what I would ask, um, contact the governor or send a tweet, um, write a letter, and just ask that Nourish New York continue. That's all you need to say. Uh, nothing complex. It can be a 30-second phone call. So please take that time. Um, contact your state assembly member and your state senator. All these folks are going to be working on the New York State budget um, really between now and April. And all we, the only message you need is um, Nourish New York should continue. Um, and phone calls work. It's easy to get cynical about this stuff. We're all busy. We're all really getting tired in this sector, right? But Phone calls work. Um, they count how many calls they get. They notice if they get a dozen calls, 20 calls, 100 calls about the same subject, um, that's effective pressure on elected officials. They do listen to that. I, so um, if you can take a few minutes today to do that, ask a couple of your friends to do that, um, it'll make a big difference in helping the people that we serve. Um, and that's it for me. I welcome your questions. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> uh, if you do have questions, we'll be taking them at the end. So feel free to throw your questions in the chat or in the question and answer uh, box on your screen, and we'll be sure to answer your questions. You know, one of the reasons that we're calling this series Beyond the Pantry, uh, and I'm saying it's a series because we're doing um, Beyond, uh, Beyond the Schools next month in February. Uh, we're going to be doing a couple other uh, coming up in the months after that as well. So um, if you like what you see today, be sure to, to pass it along. One of the reasons that we're calling it Beyond the Pantry is because 
you know, the services that pantries and other food services provide around our state are really important to people who are struggling. And, you know, the, the Kinship Navigator, my program, Ray's program, um, works closely with families who do take advantage pretty regularly of food pantries around the state. Um, many of the caregivers that Ray talked about, uh, grandparents, aunts and uncles, sometimes older siblings, are being asked to take children um, without much notice at all. I'm raising a five month old. I had nine months to prepare to take a baby into my house. Um, and still it's hard. <laughs> We're oftentimes asking grandmothers who are single, have limited income, uh, who live in a, an apartment or a house that's too small to accommodate extra children, oftentimes to take usually two kids um, with 24 hours notice, with two hours notice. And so the, the financial stress that our caregivers are going through is very immediate. Um, and so oftentimes the Kinship Navigator is looking to partner with food, uh, you know, uh, stabilizing programs throughout the state, whether that be SNAP um, or, or a food pantry. So we wanna make sure that our caregivers are getting the benefits that they're eligible for in order to maintain children in their home uh, safely and, and find some sense of stability. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about who the Kinship Navigator is and uh, ways that, you know, as you're interacting with your community, you can make sure that they're getting directed uh, to services that they're eligible for. So the Kinship Navigator has been, uh, been a program in New York since 2006. Um, we are funded through uh, the governor's budget, so we're fairly stable in terms of uh, our existence. We specialize in information, referral, education, and advocacy, and I'm going to break that down very briefly for you here. So Kinship Care, the process of, you know, when we talk about it, it seems very simple, very straightforward. I'm grandma, I'm taking care of my grandchild, that's kinship care. Well, yes, that's true. But there are a lot of facets that come into play when you need to start making decisions. So how, how do you enroll that child in school? And how do you make medical decisions on behalf of that child legally? Um, you know, stable, stability in your home. What stops, a, what stops a drug abusing parent from coming and taking that child back right away? Um, if CPS is involved, what are your custodial options around foster care? Potentially you're being asked to adopt or go into a guardianship. So there's a lot involved. It's not just simply the act of caring. There's a lot of decision-making that goes into that process. So the Kinship Navigator exists to make it easier for those folks who are experiencing kind of either the child welfare system or this caregiving a second time around uh, easier for them. So we have what we call legal fact sheets, which are essentially um, self-help guides, how to apply for public assistance, how to en enroll a child in school, how to make sure a child's getting Medicaid, um, what benefits, what other benefits a, a caregiver might be eligible for for the child in their care. We operate in all 62 counties in New York State. So our county resource list includes many different resources. If you're on today's call and you go on our website, which I'll show you in a minute, and you don't see your specific service listed on our website, I'm encouraging you that uh, at the end of this, please reach out. Our contact information is here. We wanna include you on our list of resources in our county resources. We also operate a helpline. So professionals or caregivers can call our helpline. It operates Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m you can speak with a kinship specialist live. There are case management programs that specifically serve the kinship care community around the state. There's 14 of them um, that are funded by the Office of Children and Family Services, the statewide agency that governs child welfare. Um, those services are free of charge to kinship caregivers. So they can go and they can get some kind of case management, whether that's connecting them to additional community resources or attending support groups. Um, some limited respite services to help the child, you know, help uh, the parent deal with the child, things like that. Um, there's also a limited legal referral network. There is more and more interest from the legal community in 
uh, helping kinship caregivers obtain some form of legal custody. Uh, and so uh, there are services around the state that allow, uh, you know, that will help a caregiver petition uh, for custody or guardianship. We have a lot of educational resources on our website, uh, which I'll be showing you our website in just a second. Uh, if you're interested to learn more about kinship care, our online video archive is uh, chock full of different topics of, uh, related to kinship care. And we also do some legislative education similar to what Dan's talking about. Our kinship programs um, are, are needing to be refunded year after year. It's not just an automatic thing. So services and supports for these caregivers uh, you know, needs to be fought for in the legislature every year. So we are constantly looking for champions there. Um, we also do case by case advocacy. So we're going to be telling you how to refer a caregiver to our service. And if it's a caregiver that needs um, some specific attention, we'll be sure to make that happen for them too. So when someone calls our uh, helpline number, which is located here on your screen, what we typically are trying to do if they're a caregiver is make sure that they're connected to available financial assistance and any legal advocacy that they need. So usually if someone is showing up at your food pantry or your food security resource, um, you know, they, they need some additional financial support. And kinship caregivers actually have a specific kind of public assistance that only they and the children in their care are eligible for. Uh, it is called the child only grant. Sometimes counties call it something different like a non-parent grant or grantee. Um, essentially that is a, a public assistance cash uh, assistance program that a caregiver like a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle is eligible for because the child in their care is not biologically their own child. That's why they call it a child only and a non-parent grant. Um, it's based on the resources of the child, not the caregiver. So child resources might include something like um, child support from the parent or social security uh, due to death or disability. But most children are going to be eligible for this financial grant. It's usually about $430 for one child. Uh, if you have a second child, it doesn't double, it just increases by about $150. So you're looking at somewhere in the vicinity of close to $600 if you have two kids in your home. And $600 can go a long way um, for caregivers who have some financial uh, instability. So and the legal advocacy part is related to making sure that there's some form of permanency. Again, you know, it's not just I'm, I'm grandma and I've taken this child into my home and that's the end of it. Oftentimes there are the issues that Ray talked about, mental health, substance abuse, um, that, that a, the family is dealing with and wrestling with. And so ultimately they need, they need some form of permanency, whether that's a court order or a parental power of attorney being signed over to them um, so that they can make decisions and have some form of stability in their home. So we, when those caregivers are calling our helpline, we're helping them get connected to those specific services. Um, we partner with local kinship services and departments of social services to make sure that folks are getting the benefits that they're eligible for and then taking advantage of any community resources. And then our centralized information database, we not only collect information from the caregivers so that we can follow up. Um, as I mentioned on our website, we have county resources for all 62 counties. So our helpline, like I mentioned, Monday through Friday, 10 to 4, and this is our website uh, if you want to check it out. This is a picture of our website. <laughs> Too many times someone says, check out the website. And then usually if it's me, I'm like, all right, yeah, I'll do that tomorrow. This is what our website looks like. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see um, our phone number is always pasted up there. So if you want to speak live to a kinship specialist, you can call the, that number. In the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see chat live with an agent now. Uh, if, you, if you are so used to Zoom now that you just prefer to go ahead and uh, ask questions in the chat, that is a great way to do so. That goes directly to our Kinship Navigator staff and uh, they can answer your question via chat. If you look across the middle here, online education is where you're going to find all of those videos that can help folks. Again, like it, we have a video about how to apply for public assistance. It's just 
watching somebody fill out the public assistance application, it is very boring unless you're filling out an application for public assistance. Um, more information about kinship care is also there. Legal resources is where you're going to find all of those legal fact sheets, things about uh, enrolling children in school, obtaining a birth certificate, those types of things. And then county resources is where you're going to see a lot of the information um, that we try to refer our caregivers to uh, on a, in each county. The navigator uh, usually fields in the vicinity of three to 4,000 callers per year. Um, so the community, as Ray mentioned, there are, we, there, the estimates are that there are about 195,000 children in New York being raised by a relative. Um, so our, our agency is, is trying to refer out as many of them as come across our plate, which is usually between three and 4,000 a year. In a select number of counties, um, we also offer some additional services called virtual case assistance. Virtual case assistance is basically virtual case management. So our normal service, you can kind of view as almost like a 2-1-1 for kinship caregivers. They're going to call with their questions about financial assistance or what benefits are available. And our staff are going to give them the appropriate referrals. And we usually do a one month follow up with a, a lot of our caregivers to make sure that they were connected to the resources we gave to them. Virtual case assistance is much more handholding. So if you're uh, on this call today from Warren, Washington, Saratoga, Albany, Rensselaer, Schenectady, Fulton, Otsego, or Montgomery counties, um, anytime a caregiver from one of those counties calls, uh, we assign them a case manager who's can, who can stay with that case for up to six months. Like I mentioned, typically the, the typical caregiver that we see calls because they're in a crisis mode. So they need a referral to a local food pantry. They need a referral to some financial stability and some financial assistance. So those are the things that they're calling about up front. Um, case, a, a case manager is able to kind of dig a little deeper. What other things do you need to access the resources in your community and how can we help you get to those things? So those might look like a facilitated referral or a facilitated benefit application. Um, the reason that this is only being done in a small number of counties in New York is because we're a part of a demonstration project for the federal government, from the federal government to make sure that we are um, offering services that are beneficial. So we're trying to meet a certain standard called evidence-based standard to make sure that the caregivers are being uh, served the way they need to be served. So if you, if in the course of your service provision, uh, you are seeing these types of families come and utilize your service, uh, it would be great if you wanted to refer them to the Kinship Navigator. So the best way to refer somebody to the Kinship Navigator is something that we have called the Permission to Contact form. Um, essentially, you, the service provider, would take this form, and if you have a family and they're willing to be contacted by us, they would sign and say, yes, I'm willing to be contacted. Please send uh, this information to the Kinship Navigator, and we would take uh, the responsibility off of the family to call us by calling them. Um, when we implemented the permission to contact form a number of years ago, we saw a 600% increase in the connectivity of the referrals that were coming in. Um, so we want to make sure that, that those caregivers are getting contacted. This is what the form itself looks like. It's not complicated. It basically is asking on the right-hand side for, yes, the permission for the Kinship Navigator to call, and a signature, and then how we can get a hold of them. Um, if you have any additional information as a, as a staff person that you want to provide in the bottom portion, uh, you don't have to. Um, essentially, any information in the top is what we're looking for um, from service providers. This form can be downloaded on our website. Um, there's a specific link through here that you can't click, sorry, <laughs> uh, but it is located on our homepage if you want to download the permission to contact form. We also have brochures, posters, other outreach materials that we would be happy to send directly to your organization um, to include in any of your outreach materials. So if folks are looking for services, be sure to uh, request those brochures and posters. Uh, with that, we're going to take some questions and comments. I saw a couple of things pop up in the chat, so we'll see if we can answer those. What I'm going to do in the meantime, though, is put our contact information here. 
like I mentioned earlier, um, if you want your program or your service to be listed on the Navigator website, you can reach out to Ray or myself, um, and we'll be sure that that gets up on our website. And I want to make a plug for Dan because the work that he's doing is very much needed. Um, if you want to reach out to Dan, please do so and get involved in the work that they're doing specific to food pantries too. So uh, Brandon asked the question, is there any brochures or placards that you can send us? Yes, certainly. So please, if you want brochures sent your way, um, reach out to any, all, all three of yep. us. Yep. <laughs> Probably we'll best sense. to email me directly, Brandon. Our, our Rochester distribution site has the best capability of sending those out your way. So just let us know how many you would like um, and we'll send them out to you. Next question comes from Sherry at Hunger Solutions. We value our partnership both with the Kinship Navigator and Feeding New York State. We value it too, Sherry. Uh, my question is, there is a policy opportunity to have school-aged children in kinship care directly certified for free or reduced price school meals automatically not, and not having to fill out an application. The question is, is there a way to systematically identify and certify these children? Are they in a system in any way? Is the grant you mentioned the way? We struggle to articulate how to identify these children in a way um, that New York State Education Department can tap into. So I'm gonna make that question go live so folks can see it. So Sherry, um, the question is, is there, a, is there systemically a way to identify and certify these children? One of the major issues in kinship care is that there is not a great data collection system happening unless they have been placed by Child Protective Services. Um, but a lot of the children who are being raised by relatives don't have contact with CPS, so we don't really know about them. The Office of Court Administration doesn't make data available on um, non-parent custody orders either. So we don't know that information either. The numbers that we pull come from the American Community Survey and the census data, um, people who are reporting that they're caring for kids uh, in a kinship situation. So um, Ray, I don't know if you have any comments about whether or not there's a way to make sure that kinship kids are getting free and reduced by school meals automatically. No, I think the, the, the fact that you mentioned, Sherry, about the, uh, the grants uh, might be the way to tap into it. We do have access to data on how many families are receiving the grant um, by county. Unfortunately, the problem with that is we estimate only about 15% of eligible families are receiving it. Um, so that might be something I see that you made a note. It might be a better discussion for offline. I love it. I love the idea. I think we might need to put our heads together to figure out a way to identify these families or make sure that that is being made known to families across the state. So let's put our heads together and see what we can figure out. Perfect. Um, the question from Brandon, are we in Onondaga County yet? Uh, we do serve Onondaga County with the Kinship Navigator Services. There is also a a local program, a local kinship care case management program that serves Onondaga County um, based out of Liberty Resources. So uh, if you'd like more information about Liberty Resources, you can check out our website or email one of us as well. I'm being told to make sure that we plug the next panel beyond the classroom. It's coming Thursday, February 25th. If you know an educator who would benefit from uh, learning more about kinship care, be sure to keep an eye of all out for that. We do have a weekly newsletter that goes out called Kinship Tidbits. Uh, you can sign up by emailing uh, Ray or myself to make sure you get on that distribution list as well. I uh, got another question from uh, Pachula, I think maybe is how you say that. Uh, greetings from the Office of Assembly Member Stephanie Zinnerman, 56th Assembly District representing Bedford-Stuyvesant Crown Heights. I would like to set up appointment to meet with you and your team concerning permanent funding for Nourish New York. So Dan, that's coming at you. And please contact her, uh, the I chief will, of staff. 
Thank you so much. I will reach out right away. Excellent. Good connection there. Oh, yeah. Doesn't look like there are any other questions right now. Um, again, please feel free to reach out. We would be happy to continue to collaborate with you. And it is 1230. So thanks for taking your lunchtime and spending it with us today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.